Aloha, and welcome to the episode of the Groundswell Origins Podcast, where I connect you to outstanding humans and sustainable ideas. I'm your host, Scott Martin. Today, we had the one and only Annie Shipman, who wrote the book, Simple Social Media. What a great conversation. You know, we covered off all the different little nuances that you need to think about in terms of like how to simplify it and actually execute on delivering social media that actually makes sense. And I think you'd be really surprised. It's not as complicated as you think. She really has got some great frameworks, some big takeaways. And we have such a great conversation. And, and I think that when you're thinking about social media, if you're looking, if you're overwhelmed, if you're feeling, um, you know, you're chasing the algorithm, you're going to want to listen to this episode because she really breaks down and we have such a great conversation on how you kind of kind of relook at social media in a different way. So without further ado, let's paddle in. All right. And here we are with the one and only Annie Schiffman. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be talking to you. Really excited to be talking to you. You know, I, I saw your, um, actually Joe Paluzzi is the one that um, recommended uh, your book to me and um, it's called Simple Social Media. And that's the topic of today's topic. So tell us a little bit about your background. Like what got you into uh, writing this book? Tell us a little bit about who you are um, and then we'll kind of dive into the topic of simple social media. Yeah, well, I have been working in the social media space for about 10 years, and I stumbled into it in a way that's a little bit different from many other people. I used to be an improv comic. So I was doing a show in New York City off Broadway that unfortunately was not getting a whole lot of audience. And around the same time we were doing, we would every so often get hired to do these corporate gigs. And um, we were hired to uh, to like entertain at this company's big meeting. And the keynote speaker had gone on to say about how there was this brand new thing called Twitter that companies were using to connect with their customers. And I looked around backstage at my castmates and I was like, guys, I think that we can use this to get more people to our show. And so that's how I kind of stumbled into social media before it was like social media marketing, before it like had that term. And then I just decided that I was going to learn more and more about it than most people around me knew. And so then they started asking me to help them promote their new show or to help them promote their new book or whatever it was using this new thing called social. So I have then over the years basically developed a method that I found worked really well for when you are not the subject matter expert or you don't have access to the subject matter expert or you just don't have a lot of time to devote to social media content creation. And so uh, that's what I put in Simple Social Media. Beautiful. And, you know, it's like our, it sounds like we both are like kind of OGs of social where, you know, my journey was I was actually just started getting into cat skiing. Um, I discovered cat skiing in the back country, which is like heli skiing, but it's like on a, on a, uh, almost like a, a, a tractor truck. Uh, it's a way to describe it. You get 12 people. You get about as much train as you would like a major ski resort. And it's like on track powder, like heli skiing. I lost my mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, all resorts are off the table. It's really expensive to do. And I started doing it nonstop. And I was like, social media came on. I'm like, I'm going to start sharing my, the, I'm going to figure out social media by just sharing my journey of cat skiing around and doing this, these crazy backcountry adventures. 10 years later, I actually was like, you know, had, you know, film production company making social media marketing. I just kind of fell into it as well. My, my question for you was, you know, you were, went right away to, into marketing. I was just like, I wasn't actually, th- I mean, I was in, mar- I had a marketing agency at the time, but I was just like kind of sharing content. Did you go right away? Did your first experience, was it like, were you figuring out like, like how, what was the journey like? Like what took you from the, getting people more to your shows to where you are today? Like what was that first, uh, uh, you know, threshold like? So part of it was that I, at, so I was kind of riding both horses for a while where I was performing. I was going to auditions for commercials and callbacks and things like that and touring around the country. And then also just in, in my spare time, just geeking out, nerding out on it as as much as I could. Right. And, um, so eventually then my husband, who's also a performer, he started traveling way more and we had two young children. And I just thought, you know what, I want a little bit more control over my life than the actor's life 
gave me. So, um, so that's why I just sort of thought, you know what, let me really focus here. There's been a lot of people asking me how to use social media and how they can tinker with it. And even like digital marketing, you know, before I knew that that was sort of the all encompassing umbrella of it. Like, you know, how do you use email marketing? How do you set up your website? Like just different things like that, that I would sort of dabble in as far as like how it all worked together. And so that's why then just as I was home more with my two young children, I just started tinkering around and playing with it at nighttime and nap time until then I launched. And, and so basically just freelancing. And then I launched my company, Downstage Media, when both of my children were in school all day, five days a week, because I just I needed to have the child care to make that happen. So, you know, a, a question I'd have is, you know, my experience was initially it was actually pretty profound, of course, I'm for everybody, but but it was kind of easy, like to grow like a list. People were getting on board. They wanted to grab stuff. And and over the course of the whole time, my whole journey in social media, um, you know, going from first me just sharing my journeys to then actually embedding into our marketing agency is things have changed so much. And one of the things that I kind of I, I recognize and I try to tell people is my experience has been someone will go, oh, I'll show you how to build your Instagram account. And I'm like, when did they build it? Because if they're trying to do what they did, like how they built their list and they did that 10 years ago, it's not going to work now. Um, I'm really curious about that was then, this is now, there's been this huge transformation. Could you describe what your experience has been? Because you've been like, you know, fingers deep in it. There's a trajectory and some patterns here that I think kind of help people like what's what's the road ahead? Well, that's what I've always been looking at is what is consistent because so many things change all the time and it's so hard to keep up with that. And so when I was, so basically I realized though that when I would meet with clients, there was some basic information I needed to get every time. So if we were going to meet once a month, I needed to know certain things. And I started to put those things that I needed to know into the content that I was creating, because that would make sense with the content that was going to be going out that month. And then I realized that it was so, it was such a shortcut for, um, for then what other people could use when they were making their content. And so even though, you know, the, the platforms might come and go, or the different features of the platforms might come and go, like, you know, a few years back, Facebook Live was first launching and that was really huge. And so then, you know, we worked that into our content schedule that you would have, you know, a Facebook Live for 20 minutes. I'd usually ask four questions uh, and I would sort of MC it for the client. I would ask four questions and then we would just take that and cut it up into smaller pieces and then use that the other days of the week. Well, is that much different from what's happening now? Sure. It may not be on Facebook Live. Maybe it's on a podcast, but you're taking that long form piece of content and you're chopping it up and maybe you're putting it on TikTok. Whereas before we were putting it on Facebook, but some of those elements are still consistent and still the same. And so that's why it seems dangerous to write a book about social media marketing, given how fast everything changes. But I just thought it's so overwhelming. Like you were saying, like it's, it changes so fast and changes so much that I was just like, what do most people who don't have their fingers in social need to know? Like, what's the basics for them just to have a respectable presence online for their business. And that is why we're talking. It's, that's why I noticed about, I didn't want to, I wanted to kind of like for it to come out when, because I knew that our topics were usually some around sustainable growth marketing. And most of the social media marketing books are focusing on, on the current state of the of platforms. And that you can, it's like whack-a-mole. I've get like, yeah. like you're chasing it. And I love a post that you did. I can't remember what it was. It was one of the ones that caught my attention after you introduced me to you. And it was, you said something about the effect of um, it was don't just keep make, don't worry about the platform, make the content you want to make and, and just do it your own way. And I'm like, there it is. That is what people are doing it ass backwards. They're going, they're trying to get, what's the hack of social media. And I'm like, the hack is to fucking ignore the way the platforms perform, go where your energy is. I think even the word you used, even the word energy or enjoyment or something. And my, my, I'm, I'm going on memory. So does that sound like, could you kind of profoundly kind of expand on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you're going, I, 
oftentimes, most marketers are going to tell you that you should be putting content out on the platform where your audience is. And sure, that's part of it. But I also think that you should play to your strengths. I think that you should go with your workflow so that way you can be consistent. And I'm so, as you know, I have a background in the theater, so I'm a huge Stephen Sondheim fan. And he would say, like, content dictates form. And so what what you want to put out is going to make sense on where it goes. So, you know, so I just think that that's, that's huge. It's always had a big impact on me. And so, yeah, I, I oftentimes just think like, sure, it, it's one thing for you to try to shoehorn yourself into what's hot and trendy right now. But the fact of the matter is, if you go with what's going to play to your strengths, what's going to work for your workflow, what's going to work with the content that you want to put out and what you want to say, that's going to come back to you a little bit better. You're going to get more engagement from that. And that will then propel you to keep going in those times that you may not necessarily feel like it. You're going to get a little bit more feedback than you would otherwise if you're trying to just jam a square peg into a round hole because that's what's cool right now. 100% agree. You know, the the um, the ICE framework, I don't know if you're familiar with that, with growth hacking. Are you familiar with that at all? So we, so so um, uh, uh, with the hacking growth, which is impact, confidence, and ease, and you're, you're guiding your social experiments with that, I've, I've adapted it and go, it's that. That's the logic side. But there's another side going, you need to give a different rating for ICE and just replicate that as identity. What's What is your identity of where you want to be? congruency is it congruent with you the the way that you function your workflow as you mentioned and the last the most important one is do you have the energy for it if i tell yeah. you you need to be on tiktok you have the energy for it it's not going to work anyway it's like the workout that you the the workout the workout you should do isn't the one that's perfect it's the one you actually do yeah <laughs> right? exactly you know it's what I mean? the one that you could do four or five times a week yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. and it might also be that you don't do that workout at first four or five times a week. It might be that you do that workout once a week and then two weeks later, you build it up to be doing it twice a week. And then two weeks later, you build it up to do three times a week. And that's a lot of what I'll talk about for clients. And I'll say, just just start once a week with this kind of content and then go off and make 10 pieces of content that fits into this category and then start posting that two weeks later. Now you're posting twice a week and then keep building that that is sustainable. That's doable versus just being like, you know, go from zero to 60 and all of a sudden sudden start trying to post four or five times a week. It's just, it's not going to happen. I love how you're giving people permission and releasing the pressure of social media. There's so much anxiety, which is driven by, I hate to say it, the cultural field of marketers that want you to follow their template, their process, and you're reliant on them versus just tell your own story. There's this great quote. I just read it the other day. Um, um, it's with uh, Tarantino. He goes, I made the movies that I want to make and I just brought the audience along or I shared it with you, something like that nature. And I'm like, that's kind of what you're saying. And what I believe is, is tell your, tell it your, like come out and, and tell your story versus the other way around of trying to figure out what, uh, you know, the platform should be doing or the right way to be doing it. Cause that's crazy to see of sameness. Like, it, you know, it, like, well, how do you just, when you say, you know, simple social media, what most person's argument might be is like, well, it, will it work? Right. So first of all, I think we need to manage expectations on what works means, right? So um, for me, this method has worked for me in that even though when, when you go, when you are listening to this, you're going to go and you're going to Google me and you're going to look me up on social media and you're going to see how few followers that I have. And you're going to be like, how the heck can this girl possibly have a firm that's all about social media marketing. I wish she have a book about it. Like she has so few followers. Yes, I have so few followers, but you know what? I have a very full pipeline. I have quadrupled my revenue from last year, which doubled from the year before that. And social media is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing for a small business like mine. It is bringing in new leads. It is nurturing the current leads and the current customers that I have. So that way they either become customers or they, you know, stay longer with me and they build a relationship with me. And that's what I see with my clients. It's not so much going viral. It's not so much having, you know, quadrupling the amount of fo my followers have not quadrupled as my revenue has quadrupled. But that's what 
I feel works. My subscriber count has gone up on my email list. My revenue has gone up. The, uh, you know, the customers that I'm working with, that's gone up. And that's what I see for our clients. Also, it's that <laughs> what I like to think of as sort of the wins factor. So when you meet somebody at an event and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Are you on LinkedIn? Or are you on Instagram? And there's that feeling where it's like, yeah, I am. And they kind of wince and they're like, yes, but I like, I haven't updated in a while and it's not really, it's not, apology, it's not really yeah. that great. Yeah. And so, you know, so also just having an up-to-date social media presence that you can be proud of is the equivalent of 25 years ago, having an office with a clean up-to-date lobby, right? Like mm -hmm. that would be unheard of for a small business now, but 25 years ago it wasn't. And so that's what the new updated, clean, fresh lobby is. Yeah. The, I mean, think people get so enamored with follower count. It means nothing. Exactly. In, in fact, I might even argue it means it's, it might be counter now. There's, there's like, for, I mean, I'll post stuff. Like, I think you, I think you liked one of my posts. I just post random, a little, a little, uh, a bunch of my sketches from the book. No call to action. No, nothing. I don't care. That was for, that was like raw meat to my to my fans, the people that love my book, right? Like I'm like, and they love, you know, I, I don't really care. Like I'm, I'm really looking at my own, I'm the same way. Like my social account's pretty decent, but at the same time, I am so busy. It's my, it's not about the social media. It's playing a supporting role. And I think right. so many people are looking at social media as the role of activation. And I'm, I'm curious what your, you know, uh, feeling is. I know it, it can, it can definitely create sales activation, but it feels like when I started doing social media, there was like 80% of people were creators and 20% were consuming and people were taking call to actions and clicking links and stuff. And now it's so many more people are creating. There's this massive sea of sameness. It seems like the people that are consistently there or the people who buy into my podcast or get to know me or might read my book, they're the kind of fans. And I've just got this small, but you know what? That potent group is, is pulling the weight of, I, I don't, I don't need to go, how do I make 50,000 followers on Instagram to be more successful? What exactly. is sort of, what do you, like, what's your kind of take on the social account and where the platforms are changing? Like what's, what's kind of your take on that? Well, I think that people are consuming. I think, I think you're right. And I, um, although mm, the tide seems to be turning in the other way now, whereas you're saying initially it used to be a lot of content creators and, um, no, no. Also, Initially, it was like a small amount. I meant backwards. There was a small amount of okay. content creators, and now there was lots of people consuming it. Now it's a lot of people creating it, and very few people consuming it. Well, or I if think they are, seeing, they're... Yeah, know. I think we're seeing a lot more consumption happening on TikTok as people like what's being put out on TikTok, but they don't necessarily want to have to go through all the edits and make those sketches or right. those videos, right? So I think that we're seeing that. We're seeing a lot that a lot with Reels, that people are consuming content versus necessarily making it. Um, and I think that's partly because people are seeing that so few of their followers actually get served their content. You know, I, I think it's something like reach has gone down 32% on Instagram, according to Social Insider from 2021 to 2023. I just put it on my blog not too long ago. So, I mean, I think that people are really disheartened. And that's why, like you're saying, it's you see it in the influencer world too, this idea of micro influencers and stuff like that, just having a small but engaged audience is really important. And knowing that you might need to engage with them in a few different media. So for you, it's your book is one way that they're absorbing your information and your your content and you and your podcast is another way. And social is only one part of that. Yeah. It's like the, I, one of the things I, I tell people is Fill a row. Don't try to jump to filling a stadium. I mean, I think everyone's trying to sell filling a stadium. And, um, you know, I have an empty stadium. There's a lot of people with lots of, I have a social accounts that are huge with very little engagement, you know, yeah. and it's because I was actually chasing, trying to build a big following and consumption's an interesting word. You know, I, I think of consumption, um, there's attention and, and the consumption is like, are they like the social short form? I feel like it's kind of like licking versus eating, you know, and like, I, I noticed that you're really advocating towards like longer form. I, I feel like long form might be making a comeback because are they really consuming if they're like flipping it? Like we think the metrics are showing their, their connect, but are they really consuming it? Or are they just whipping through? Like, I'm not sure anymore. You know, I, I don't know where, yeah. I, where I land on this. 
Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure either. I think it's going to be interesting to see. I I've been seeing more too that like more people talking about blogs coming back, which I find really interesting. I haven't seen any data on that. It just seems like something that is in the air that people are talking about. So I don't know. Is but old I just becoming think, the new? You know, like exactly direct marketing is I mean, making a comeback or something. You know, so yeah, I think for sure. But but partly about what you're saying about you know smaller numbers. I mean, I used to perform in New York City and and those theaters were tiny, you know, we're talking about a hundred people, but I've had people say to me, I don't know, Annie, like, should I even bother putting out stuff? I only have a hundred followers. And I'll say, if you had a hundred people in that room and that was a sold out crowd for you that night, you would go, you would go and you would do the show and you'd feel great about it because you had a show for a hundred people. So yeah, is it, you know, the same as a stadium, you know, Taylor Swift performing for 72,000 people? No, it's not the same. But for me, that's still a valuable experience. And I'm hoping if I do my job right, it's a valuable experience for whatever of those 100 people are actually sitting there and paying attention to what I'm doing. So I think about that all the time. Like, what did a room look like? If, if, you know, if I was performing for a crowd of 100 people or 1,500 people or 300 people, like, what does that look like? And I really try to envision that to help remind me, like, let's get a little perspective here, Annie. Like, 100 people is a good amount of people. That's such a great perspective. If you had to feed I mean, them at your wedding, yeah. <laughs> be a lot of people you'd, be, wedding. you'd be spending some money. You know, it's, you'd be spending you, some like, money. I think that's, that's what's the unique thing you bring to it is you're giving people permission to kind of change their mindset about it. And I think that is something that's not been done well, is there's there's such a pervasive grow, 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 and it's it's for grow sake versus connect. And I think that, you know, giving people, you're right, that's a great way to frame it. Like if you had physically that many people in room, you'd be overjoyed, you know, like why not treat it the same way? You know, that's that's a great analogy. So another challenge that I think that you solve, a problem that I see, I've experienced it myself is overwhelm. You know, it's like, yeah. I need to be posting every day. And it's like, it's fucking exhausting. Pardon my French. You know, it's like, yeah. and, um, and I think that when I personally shifted to going, I'm just pretty, I'm just, I'm giving myself the permission to put what I want, what I'm ready. I'm not necessarily putting on a schedule. I know that like doing things consistent, like the podcast and things for sure. I'm trying to leave at some level, but I'm kind of putting the brakes off of like, if I don't love it, I don't want to share it. And that's kind of where I'm at in my social media journey. I'm curious what your um, what your perspective is on that? Yeah, I mean, the only thing that, though to be aware of is if you don't love it, not sharing it, that could go into the world of perfectionism, where it's like if it's not perfect, then I'm not going to share it. So that's the only thing that I would be aware point. of. Yeah. So, um, so sometimes because I think that there's just the muscle of creating stuff because. You know, I mean, In the Heights was a great musical. Uh, Bring It On, great musical that Lin-Manuel Miranda did. He did both of those Broadway shows before he had the juggernaut of Hamilton. But he needed to get the reps in of writing those shows and working on those shows and getting those reps in is just as important for you and the content that you create. So for many people that have a marketing team of five or less for their company or for their brand, Sometimes it's just getting those reps in and figuring out, okay, what is our workflow? How can we get a video out a little bit faster? Do we need to put out video? Because does it take too long? Or, you know, what, what can we be doing instead? And so part of that is sharpening the sword. So I do think it's important to be consistent. I like that. I like having a schedule because I, for me, and I, I appreciate what you're saying in, in terms of like giving people permission, because I just feel like So much of my journey has been with, you know, very little to no childcare, having young kids. I mean, now they're, you know, tweens and teens, but my husband's very successful in his work. He travels all the time. At one point he was traveling 200 days of the year. Like I had to figure out how the heck was I going to make this happen in that time frame to still show up for my family the way that I wanted to show up for them. So, so many of these theories and that then became practices that now are parts of the book is based on just having to get through so much of life in a really practical way. So yeah, I love to use schedules and I love to create content in batches because I know that I could probably 
bang out a bunch between 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. after my kids have gone to bed, right? So that's why so much of, of this stuff that I create, I think is a little bit different because so often we're hearing from people who it's their job to create content, right? Like we'll hear about it on the news. Well, that's the news is their job to create content. You'll hear about it from other marketers. That's their job to create content. But what are we hearing from people who are actual business owners in how they are putting out their own stuff and then advocating for their clients to do it in a sustainable, practical way that isn't all about spending four hours a day editing a video for an Instagram reel? Really good distinction. I, you know, when I said that, I just for my personal brand, Actually, my business plan for Groundswell, it's on a schedule. It has a workflow. Yeah. It has a, I have a content calendar. I've got like, you know, and it, it's, it's like there is a, and there is actually when I say I love, sometimes I'll put stuff that's janky. It's not, it's actually, I'm not a perfectionist. I like, that's why sometimes like, you know, I, I get a little bit of like, you know, my team might go, oh man, you, you didn't quite spend time. I'm like, I just love it. It's like, let's just get it out. Like, so for me, it's, it's, um, uh, when I use that word, it's definitely not perfection because I definitely, I agree. People can fawn over their and 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 never get going. There's no energy yeah. in that. People don't care. In fact, I'd almost argue that now the more perfect it is, less people trust it. Yeah. In some ways. I mean, I'm not saying it has to be janky, but I'm just saying, you know, just real. Yeah, I think there's there's a difference between slick and professional, right? So mm -hmm. you I, I always like to feel professional. I always like to feel that, you know, I'm I'm showing up and I'm I'm almost like kind of not like putting on a show, but, but, you know, like I'm there, I'm a, I'm a pro I'm ready. And, yeah. um, without being overly slick, you know, like without, I don't know, I always feel like, um, it's when you, it's when you see the people and they have like the, the headset or something and they've got too many things crossing across the stage and the screen and stuff like that. Like, I don't know, for me, that style doesn't always appeal to me, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's something to be like elevated so that way your audience knows that you know what you're doing, you know how to put stuff out there that's quality material um, that they're going to be able to get some insight from and some information or some, you know, entertainment from versus things that are just kind of too polished and too slick. Because I agree. I think that people, they can't tell if it's too well done almost that they don't, they think that it's an ad. So then they just scroll right by it. Mm hmm. Yeah, like what about AI? Like with like what you're seeing with uh, the advent of AI, it's, I mean, there's some incredible uh, tools that are really, I mean, we're using AI like Descript for editing clips and stuff mm -hmm. and different things that are really useful. Um, where where do you see in, in not only just production, but also possibly like, you know, people using AI where they're, they're not, it's not them, it's an AI that's now talking. Like they put a transcript now and you can see people using it. Like where are you seeing social media where, where does that line cross from professional where people are almost going so far in DI where it's it's not relatable to the business or, or the person? Do you have a um, do you have a point of view in this direction right now? Well, I do think it's cool to experiment. So I don't want to naysay anyone who is trying all of these new tools that are like a year and a half old. I mean, if you think about how fun early MTV videos were because people were trying crazy stuff. They were trying weird. It was yeah. a whole new medium. So I don't, I don't want to like put the kibosh on anyone's creative experimentation. Uh, that being said, I'm definitely seeing a pushback from, and maybe it's just because I'm in the marketing space. So these are people who are pretty keen and looking at it with um, sharper eyes potentially but I think that a lot of people are picking up on copy that has been written by AI. They're already starting to see what the patterns are. So they're already starting to see through that. And that's when it becomes too slick, right? That's when you mm -hmm. lose some of that authenticity. So, I mean, I, I say experiment, go for it, try it. Why not? And the audience is basically going to dictate what you can and can't do. I mean, I will say that what I've been trying to do more is figure out what makes me unique and really heighten that even more when I'm speaking. So I will oftentimes bring things back to music, um, oftentimes pop music from the 80s and 90s. I will oftentimes bring things back to theater and I will oftentimes bring things back from the 
digital to the analog. Th those are some things that you can often tell because it's just that idea. Like I want people to know like, oh yeah, Annie definitely wrote this because right. she just, she just dropped a reference to Lilith Fair and there's no way that no AI, way that AI, would, AI would have brought that it. into the fray. I, so. I, I, that's kind of, that's this, uh, that's where I'm sitting in it. Like I'm for sure test and try, try stuff, but you know, it's like, do you remember when, well, not remember when, like you get an email, mm -hmm. it's personalized to you. There's even like, you know, even things that only, only the, uh, this, you know, the company would know they personalize it, to, but you know, it's a form, a form. It's like, you can yeah. feel it. It's like, there's something about it that you can just, I can just tell. Right. And, and that's what I'm seeing showing up in, in posts and stuff is it's like, I don't know if it's slick or if it just seems like not, it's there's something off and I can, my, I can just feel it. Right. I don't know how to explain that. And then I feel like that's what's preventing me from, you know, um, you know, just go, like, I, I don't know. I, I feel like you got to have your fingerprints in it. You know, it's got to feel like you yeah. said, like, like, like you can tell Scott wrote that. Maybe it was a, like, as I use Grammarly, technically that's an AI. It helps correct my grammar, right. you know? So is that my really like, am I being authentic by saying I don't like AI? I mean, I'm using it. Um, but it's the, I guess you're right. That's kind of where I'm thinking is like where you lose your voice, your uniqueness is, is what's distinctive to you. What, like, how do you see, like when you're thinking about doing production and you're trying to make that distinctive, what do you look for? Like, how do you actually work clients through going, how do they find their voice or their distinct direction? Well, I think part of it is figuring out, first of all, just the basic operations, right? Like, how do you do what you do? What makes your way of doing things a little bit different from your competitors, right? So what are those things? And then um, and then what are the sort of um, the you-isms? What are the things that you find yourself saying over and over and over again to your clients when you're meeting with them? Because those are the things that we can really start to expand on and play with and use as the basis for for your brand voice, for those different things. And that's oftentimes what I'll talk about too in terms of creating multiple variations that are based on a theme, right? So um, if I am saying, so I'm trying to think of something that, I, that I'll say all the time that would be like a euism for me, but... Um, well, Gosh, mine would be paddle like, in. I do that. Like, I go, go at the end of my at the end of mine. Let's paddle in, right? And and people and my my audience will send me and I love it when they go and I'm just paddling in. Like they'll say it back to me. I think it's hilarious. Sure. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So so yeah. you've got that right. Paddle in. Your audience knows what that mean. What that means. So it, it may be that you create a post that is just an image of paddling in with a very short piece of text that's going to go with it as the caption. And then maybe you're also going to create another post that explains what the whole paddle in means. So that way some new followers of yours or newer to you may have that idea reinforced. And maybe you're going to say it a third way and a fourth way. And then all of a sudden this just starts to become part of your brand voice because you're saying maybe a handful of things a bunch of different ways. So now all of a sudden your audience is starting to pick up on what those you-isms are and you're starting to say them over and over and over again. And that's helping to develop your brand voice. I love that you're saying that because I think people need to hear that, to be honest with you, because uh, I think one of the things that, that um, I observe is that people compare and they think they're comparing against mm -hmm. other feeds and they're going, but I'm not that big. I don't have that big of an audience or, I need to see it this way. And what you're saying, or at least I'm hearing what you're saying, and what I, I would definitely agree with is go your own way, like say your own voice, because that is, you can have like a, a hundred people selling the same thing and no one's going to say it your way if you lean into right. that because, and there's people that just love that. They, they, they're your, I think uh, what is uh, uh, my last guest, uh, J, uh, Jay Kunzo, he goes, don't be their best, don't be the best, be their favorite. I love that. Right. That's such love a great that. way to frame it. Yeah. Well, also, if you think about it in terms of what would, even if it's something that we've heard a lot, what is your, what does it sound like when you're involved with it, right? So if you think about uh, collaborations, we see, we see collaborations all the time, right? So my, I've got a 10-year-old and um, she's obsessed with Harry Potter, right? So 
Reebok and Harry Potter or the Wizarding World, they just had a collaboration. And so it's like, well, what would Reebok shoes look like with a Harry Potter element on top of it, right? So it's like, well, what does and what does this version of this post look like with you on top of it? Or what does this phrase look like when we actually put you on top of that? Right. And so it's it's finding it's those kinds of things are oftentimes how to start finding your brand voice. If you think about that. Right. Like how many times have, um, you know, has the song Blackbird been covered a ton of different times, but each artist is going to have their own sound to it. And so you want to think about like, oh, wow, well, if I were doing that, what would my sound be? And how can I do that with the same basic bits of material, especially if you're a company that has, you know, um, I don't know, like I'm thinking about different, like a car dealership where everyone, many times you're working with the same bit of material, or if you're, even if you're like contracted to work with a partnership with some other company and they're sending you content, well, how can you take that content and put your spin on it? So that way they can tell that it, your audience can tell that it comes from you. I love that. Yeah, it's uh, collaborations. So there's really kind of two layers. One is like, it's almost like remixing existing content. Uh, yeah. It's like one form of like, like you're doing a remix. And the other is co- actual collaborations, like no, cho- no peanut butter, no chocolate, no Reese's Pieces. And I think that that actually, in my mind, is a really interesting new direction. I think we're going to see a lot more of. I don't know what your thoughts are. This is me kind of forecasting ahead a little bit, but. Um, like for example, I'm doing a I'm doing a collaboration right now with Guru Singh. Guru Singh is a third generation yogi. Um, he's world renowned. Uh, you know the guy is amazing. Like one of my best podcast episodes was him. He did more than Dave Navarro from the Chili Peppers. Like in terms of like how many people listen to it. And see, so, you know, he and I collaborating. I'm on the mindful marketer. We're using universe, nature, biomimicry applied to marketing. It's so interesting. I'm about to release this little this um, this 25 hour course, and it's just us talking about it. And it's a collaboration. And I loved it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what else can I collaborate with? That's kind of cool because it's bringing these two audiences together. That Totally. It's it's his content. He's like his audience. He's got like 30,000 yogis. They've never heard him talk about business. And I've got people that have never heard me talk about nature, biomimicry applied to. And it's like interesting. That's sort of fun. It has a lot of energy. And that's kind of I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit about collaboration and the pure joyful energy of like, if you enjoy it, it's probably going to be really good. Like I kind of look at that content, some of my favorite content. I'm like, I had so much fun creating it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I would love to say that that oftentimes happens. I, I think a lot when you say that about my improv days, when I used to go on stage and not know what I was going to do a 90 minute show about with three other people. And there was definitely some times where we had a good time, but the audience didn't necessarily and way other that the audience had a great time, but we were like, Oh my gosh, that did, that just felt like trouncing through the mud, but we finally got through that show. But I love, I, I think collaborations are for, um, for people who are very creative and um, inspired and curious I think collaborations are great. And then, of course, like from a marketing perspective, of course, you're getting in front of somebody else's audience. They're getting in front of your audience. But I think it just helps you stretch a little bit more to figure out, oh, well, what if I, you know, like, let me work on this. And by working with this person, you learn this skill or you meet this other person. I just love it. I love that kind of a thing. That's why I've always loved doing improv comedy versus stand up, right? Like, Improv is for people who play well with others. Stand-up is for people who like to write by themselves. And even though writing comes naturally to me, I'm so much more of a collaborative person that like, I think well, I think better, I think faster when there's other people in the room with me so that way we can you know, play off of one another. And I find it's oftentimes the same thing with content. I will oftentimes just say to someone, hey, let's, what could we do together? Let's figure out something that we can work on together. Well, this podcast is a collaboration. This, yes, you know, like that's this a combo. is. And it, what's funny is because when you said improv before, I meant to actually this that a thought went whoop, and I was going to come back to it was you because you said you had improv background and then you're talking about structure and I'm like, that's a really interesting spectrum. You came from improv and you're talking about structure. I'm like, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, well, believe it or not, a lot of improv comedy, especially long form improv comedy. So that usually means stuff that's not skits or sketches, but usually if it's longer than say 20 minutes or so, 
there oftentimes is a form on top of it. So much like when you're watching a basketball game and there are certain plays that the players will learn, it's the same kind of a thing with, uh, and, and then of course you don't know how it's going to play out, so to speak. Um, but yes, oftentimes, and that's what got me into story brand, the reading that book, building a story brand by Donald Miller, because I'm a story brand certified guide now, but it was a very quick bridge for me because in improv, I had learned so much of narrative structure because we would have to make up 20 minute musicals. We'd have to make up a 30 minute musical on the spot. And so we needed to learn what are those formulas that Hollywood uses time in and, and time out and then or time and time again. And then when you make that bridge to marketing, uh, it makes sense. And I knew then that that was going, that that was sort of the aha moment for me in terms of really diving in deep to marketing strategy and for how it all works together and how you can use those structural elements in marketing in a way that your audience is going to respond to. But yes, believe it or not, there's a lot of uh, structure in improv. I'm not I'm sure you have all. a lot of listeners who have taken improv classes. So all of, you know, so if you're listening and you've taken an improv class, I see you. I know the structures that you know. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, I mean, the hero's journey, if you know that, okay, now we need to be preparing for them meeting the master or something, you can kind yes. of, you got some cues, so you can kind of go through the journey. So, you know, the story brand with uh, Donald Mill, I met him actually something a couple times now. I'm a Tony Robbins um, plat partner, so he speaks at Business Mastery, oh. and he's, he's yes. at those events, and we've done, like, where he actually does sessions with us. So that story brand framework is really powerful. Like, it gets really succinct on on telling your story. I think that's probably an incredible skill for anyone that's trying to deliver a message on social media. You've that story brand. How does the story brand kind of been applied to your book? Have you was there a crossover at all, where you've kind of like, there, um, yeah, share with that. There is a crossover. So in with story brand, you oftentimes learn the talking points that you're going to use to talk about either your company or a division of your company or product that you offer, whatever it is, right? Uh, anything that you want to promote you create what's called a brand script, basically a series of talking points. So what I did was I created a game where you take that brand script and each talking point gets a little number, and then you can create a social media caption by putting two of those talking points together. And so you roll dice, you get your random numbers, you put them together with a call to action, and that becomes your copy for your social media post. So I talk about that in the, uh, I talk about in the book, like how you can play that game. Um, and I've, yeah, talked to JJ Peterson about it on the Marketing Made Simple podcast. But yeah, like it's just that whole idea of taking those talking points that you have and grabbing a couple of them, turning them into social posts. Yeah, it's like remixing a little bit, you know, it's it's like yeah. having, because I mean, I think a lot of people when they go to do social media, they go, they go up and they go, okay, I guess I got to create something. You go from a blank piece of paper where you're, yeah. you know, and, and what I, I agree is like having a, a well of, of things that you can sort of pull from and, and create from, and that's going to accelerate that. Um, what about um, like repurposing content? You know, I think that, um, you know, that's something where either on one hand, people think it's, if they're repurposing too much, it's like too much of the same. But, but at the same time, you know, just I think content is is an asset. Like you've you've invested in it. Um, where do you sit with that in your process in your book or you're thinking about that whole repurposing content? I love repurposing content. I love it. I think all the time that we all have a whole bunch of commercial jingles floating around in our heads. Uh, when Taylor Swift goes on stage for the Eras tour, she does not come up with new songs every single time. She plays the hits, right? And so I think it's really important to take your work and to repurpose it. I love, for example, just as a, I, I think it's, I'm so grateful that you've asked me to be on this podcast. So one thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create at least three to five posts that are pointing my audience to what they would gain from listening to this episode of your podcast and other episodes of your podcast, because I just think that's part of being a good 
guest. I think it helps to strengthen the relationship that you and I have. So that way, you know, six months from now, when I post about this again, because I haven't just forgotten about it, that it's like, oh yeah, Annie is, yeah, she's, she's in my corner. She's trying to help me get my, you know, get my message out to a few more people. Right. So I'm a big fan of repurposing content for so many different reasons, but mostly to help strengthen relationships either between the people that you've collaborated on to make that content or between you and your audience to remind them of some of the great, you know, or or just of some of the ideas that you've put out there or some of the lessons that they can learn from it. I'm a big fan of the idea of um, create once, distribute to forever. And so it's sort of like that Ross Simmons idea. And um, I'm a big fan of that. So I love repurposing content. Again, it's just, it's just practical. Nobody wants to sit at a blank screen and try to figure out like, oh, what kind of content am I going to create? But if you could say, how can I turn this podcast episode into five different social media posts? Boom. That's a little bit easier to go on. I love that. And, you know, thank you for that, for even saying that, you know, a lot of guests, um, I never hear from them again. Um, and they'll, they'll what? repost maybe, oh, the re- well, I mean, some of the ones like Joe Pine and Lucy and stuff, I'm friends with, like a lot of them are my friends, but some of them not, like yeah. some of them, they post when they, when they go live and they're here from again, but I, but I actually continue. If, if you look at my own LinkedIn, I created what's called the, the Groundswell podcast journal. I'm bringing back all the original year one and I'm going, working back Boom. my catalog, creating an article about what I've learned since I've done that podcast and my insights. And then I've shared them on LinkedIn. And the reason I started doing it was because I got this weird blip on my, my podcast and it was because I was blowing up in France or something. I can't remember. It was some of the countries I'm going, what's going on? Like, why is like, <laughs> so, why are we going, why are we trending in, in Europe or whatever? And I looked, yeah. it was Joe Pine, one of his episodes from year one. It just out of the blue blew up. And I'm like, and it really, I'm, I, I was always wanted to honor and, and I always like kind of naturally was like reposting, but that gave me the insight. And the insight was, what if I actually intentionally, as I go through, I become differentiating my podcast but when people are on my show, I'm always marketing them. And that was mm-hmm. actually, so I, 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 so I actually have multiple different things that I'm doing to actually make this like a forever podcast platform because then it wants to be a place worth investing in and partnering in and kind of growing together. Right. So right. I thank you well, for saying that because that's, that's, I think is such an, an, if you're listening and you're on someone's podcast, you do that and you are going to, you're going to, you're going to have more benefit than, than just trying to go on to new podcasts. There's more benefit there. Grow deep, you know, before you kind of grow big, you know? Yeah. And I'll talk about the um, best, of, what I, what I think of as the, the best of Dana Carvey idea. Right. So I talk about this in simple social media where when I was like, 13 or 14 years old, oftentimes SNL would have on prime time. So like eight o'clock or nine o'clock, usually like during like rerun weeks or something like that, they would just show like the best of Dana Carvey or the best of Phil Hartman. Right. And so they would take those sketches and they would repackage them and they would put them out on prime time, which was great because then it made me more excited to watch the show than on Saturday night to stay up. And also like you're getting like the best of the best right there in those moments. And so I, I think that people should do that all the time. I have a Spotify playlist. That's just the podcast appearances that I've made. And yeah, I mean, even if you take like your five best blog posts from 2023, not the best ones, but maybe like the ones that got read the most or the ones that got the most clicks or like whatever it is, start putting them together in those anthologies. So that way you don't have to come up with new stuff. You could keep mining all the things that you and your collaborators have already created. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is some gold right there. You know, that's definitely got a higher ROI and it's more sustainable when you attach that. There's another um, effect I think that happens when you do that, in my opinion, which is now you actually really want to take care and, and make content that matters. Like, because you're going, it's not like a junk food. You're just going to, well, I'm just going to throw it out there. You're going to go, oh man, I might want to repurpose this. So I want to put a little more intention around, you know, whatever that is. I'm not to be perfect, of course, but, but I think that there's an extra level of attention. Cause if you know that something, it's like when you're building something, if you know, it's like, it's got to, I got to build something. that's just got to last this wedding versus I need this to last five years. You're going to build it a little differently. And that's kind of 
maybe that has a, another effect in terms of like how you go about things or in, in my experience with my team. And I don't know if you cover this in your book, your thinking is storage, content storage mm-hmm. and management of file systems. Because what I found is when I wanted to go back into the system to remix, it was a dog's breakfast if I didn't. And then we had to really regroup on our team on identifying, organizing, and being able to pull that content out. But thankfully now with AI and Descript, we can actually pull it out based on pull up all the content, the the video or audio where Scott talks about, I don't know, collaboration and let's make Mm -hmm. a remix of it. And that's actually what's coming with AI. What, like, where do you sit with that? Because to make marketing simple, not, not a very unsexy topic is managing the content. Do you have any sort of thoughts on that? Yeah, I do think that it's something that you want to consider all of the time because eventually you're going to run out of bandwidth. And I mean that literally, and I mean that figuratively. So you're going to run out of bandwidth in that, like you're just going to run out of space or you're going to need to buy more storage or whatever, but you're going to run out of bandwidth figuratively in that, like, you're not going to remember what you have, or you're not going to be able to sift through it. So I do think it is something that I think it, it is something that you want to think about because also like that helps you curate what it is that you work on in the first place. Right. So like you're saying, if you want to put out a higher quality of output, then maybe it means that you don't you're not creating as much stuff. But the stuff that you do create is a little bit of a higher caliber. And maybe instead of moving on to the next thing so fast, you actually take that five minutes to tag it or categorize it however you would need to. So that way, the other people on your team or you later on can find it and remix it as necessary. I mean, we like to use. um Trello boards in terms of having lists for clients to be able to put raw material on there and then having links to Google drives or things like that. Um, And then we'll also just have different lists that are according to each of the letters in the pager method that I talk about in my book. So um, promotional content that is, you know, either in the can or that we're working on articles, content, general engagement, things like that. Um, So that's one way that we organize it. But yeah, I mean, I think I say this to my children all the time. Sometimes more is just more. So if you can really figure out a way to make less and then store it a better way that you can find it and organize it, that's more valuable than just having more. It's funny, you know, this weekend, I'm on a, it was like minus 40 here in Canada, like Morty, it was so cold. Right. And, um, um, and so we're kind of like totally like hunkering in and I'm like, I, I, and I diversified and I started working on my phone and I, it's like my phone, I'm so busy creating content and doing things that it's sort of like a massive junk drawer is the only way I could describe it. Like, in, you know, yeah. and, and I'm like, and I know I've got this content and things that I save or write, or I've half, like I've, I've kind of half created and I don't know how to get to it. So I don't actually tap the resource. And what I did was is I've taken like four days. It's been like four days that we've been in this and I'm, I'm done now and I've organized them. And I'm like, I'm about to pump up more content because my content, I can get my desktop, I can make it beautifully, but I'm always on the road and I want to use yeah. my phone more. And I realized it's sort of like the insight of me going, Scott, I got to stop treating moving so fast and and almost like the junk drawer, the kitchen. I don't know if anyone has one of those, but I, most people do. Where you just throw it in and you go, I'll deal with it later. At some point, you can deal with it later or you're just never going to access it. And that's kind of where I think that sustainable content marketing is you got to kind of clear out the junk drawer or, or at least have the, some level of discipline of getting to inbox zero once every quarter or something, you know, because um, I just realized I'm not tapping – some great content that I've created or partnered with, like someone like yourself, if we recorded something in a year ago and I'm like, Oh man, I just, I'm rediscovering content. I'm like, I have so much content using the stuff that you said that I have in the back that I'm like, Oh my God, I don't have to even create new content if I don't want to (laughs) for a long time, you know? Yeah. You just have to find it. You just have to discover it. Yeah. Find it and mine it. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a tricky thing for sure. I have weekly meetings with myself. And one part of that is just trying to deal with all of the um, images that I have on my phone or screenshots that I've taken, Um, because oftentimes my screenshots I'll save to my desktop. So then I just try to, between my phone and my desktop, just make sure that I take those 
images and file them where they're supposed to go. I do that weekly, but... Oh, you're disciplined. See, I haven't been doing that for years. We're talking 15,000 files I've had to touch. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I feel so good, but I feel so good now. There's like, (laughs) I'm not going to... I feel like free. I I can't explain it. Like It's like, because I've always had this angst of like, there's something about if you want to move quickly and and like, it's like direction or speed, right? And you want to have one have no direction. But if you have a bunch of things in your way and the path isn't clear, you're not going to get fast anyways. And that's, and I think about how much time I would spend finding a piece of content that I knew was somewhere looking for it to create it. And then what I do is I wouldn't publish it because I ran out of energy and time. I'd be like, Oh fuck, I'll do it later. And I think that if we can make it easier for yourself, um, you know, you could publish more. So, you know, if you want to share with us, like any more sort of overview of, of the book, what is sort of the, the three biggest takeaways that if someone's going to read your book, like we've kind of, pro- I feel like we probably touched on them. You can kind of reiterate them if you want, but what are some of the three of the biggest takeaways by grabbing your book and they can take away and, and it's going to change their, their way of thinking around social media? Well, one thing that we haven't touched on is we've talked so much about content, mm-hmm. but Uh, Another part of the book that I like to bring up is how important it is to actually comment, reply, share other people's content. Um, You know, I told you I like to bring up a lot of 80s and 90s references. So it's the idea of you down with OPP. So other people's posts, right? So I was able to grow, you know, a couple of years ago, I was able to grow my Twitter account considerably without creating anything on my own, just replying to people with helpful, thoughtful, empathetic, or insightful replies. And people really respond to that because everyone wants to get comments. Everyone wants to get shares. And so when you can do that and then add your two cents, it is a really great way of still having a presence and building relationships on social media without actually having to make content. So if you're somebody and you're like, oh, I just got to get started. I would say do that three times a week, 15 minutes at a time. And that's it. Really simple. Just commenting, sharing. That's all you got to do. And, you know, it could get strategic as far as who's who you're commenting on. And I talk about that a little bit more in simple social media, like, you know, how you choose which ones you're doing. But basically, if you just are reaching out to your colleagues, the people that you hire, the people who hire you, your allies in the field, then already right there, you'll be light years ahead of other people. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. Another is to look for a scheduler for your social media posts that can automate your content versus purely scheduling them. And a lot of tools are now coming out with this. And I have resources that you can download whether or not you buy the book that will have lists of different tools that do this. But the difference is you can say, I want this post to go out on Tuesday, January 16th at 11 a.m. on LinkedIn. I want this post to go out a week later at 11 a.m. on Tuesday on LinkedIn and this post. And you have to like one by one schedule each one out versus automating where you just put a whole bunch of posts that are evergreen in the library and you say, post any of these at 11 a.m. on Tuesday on LinkedIn. And when you run out, start all over again. Oh, interesting. So So like almost like putting it into like a, here's a, here's a box, just pull out of the box at will and just publish it. It's like, okay, it's interesting. That would definitely, for somebody that's like, doesn't want to be that, that doesn't, because most people, why are you really posting on that day? If you don't have an intentional reason, that would be a great solution to just like, letting go. It's a huge time saver. It's an enormous time saver. Um, so that's why I'll oftentimes say create a batch of like 10 posts and then, you know, and because especially like once you get going, once you're warmed up and stuff, you could usually bang them out pretty quickly. Yeah. And, um, you know, like if you use the dice method with your talking points, with your brand script, like you can make them so fast and then you put them into your content library. And if you say like every Tuesday, have these go out, I just, these 10 posts, well, that's 10 weeks right there. And do you think that your audience is going to remember um, that you're reposting something that you posted 10 weeks ago? If they even saw it, I doubt they would remember. And if they remember, I doubt they would care. Is the dice method so, in your book, by the way? 
It is. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. You know, the, yes. the idea of like where someone's going, you got to create your own content. So I did an experiment, started 10 years ago, um, where because I actually had a huge following. Um, my, all my social media on Facebook was huge because of Heli Skiing and such vibrant content. And I was like, okay, I know that I get it because can I get an audience if I didn't? Because that's original content, us filming Backcountry Heli. So it's super juicy. Yeah, it, it was like, it was so easy to get massive amount of hits. And I felt like raw meat to my friends that just love powder, right? So I was like, how do I actually, so I, what I did is I follow my passion. I go, I'm actually consuming, I love surf art. So I'd always like look at surf art and I'm like, what if I never produced a single piece of content, not one, and all I do is share other content. So I created Surf Art World as an experiment. I'm the largest surf art curator, digital curator on online because that's all I do. And it's like, it's grown. I've got all these relationships with all these artists and stuff. And it just proves you don't need like, and I, enjoy, and it's actually what, like I use that as therapy. Like when I need to like, like I want to have like a really, like I want to sort of enjoy myself on social media. <laughs> we'll just go do that because they're so grateful. They're so thankful. And I love looking at the art and it's like, I just love it. And I, I have no monetization path, but nice yep. thing is I weave that into my business because it's kind of is part of my business. Like it's about surfing. I can now use that surf paintings and put content and the artists are happy to be shared as long as I source them. So I've kind of found ways to kind of make it part of my unique point of view. But I love that you said that because that I think is like gives people permission to go, you don't have to always create your own content. Right. You don't, especially if you're a CEO or something like that. You know, if you just if you just come in and give some thoughtful comments here and there, just add your two cents. That's that's Where's a the really spectrum, great though? strategy. There's a ton of people just reposting content and I kind of look at they're just mailing it in. They're just hitting repost. But you said something oh, no, really mean, valuable there. They're adding some unique. Yeah, add your two cents. Yeah. Add your add what makes you you onto it versus purely sharing it. Yes, I should say that. Yeah, I think that um, people they they I heard that and I'm like, I bet you someone didn't quite catch that. That's the genius part right there is we share it, but add your little insight on it. I think that's where people are really interested. Go, oh, okay, you know, like I've seen this uh this same you know video from Michael Jackson, but you're totally you're making this unique take on it. You know, like that's cool. Right. Like. I think that's what people are craving, that unique insight. Yes, exactly. Um, so I think, so you said three takeaways. So one is you can keep, not just put out media, but but be social, mm -hmm. right? By by sharing, adding your two cents, commenting. Um, two is looking to see if you can automate versus schedule mm -hmm. your posts. Um, and then three is to... Uh, you know, create your content in batches, but basically like vary the theme. So create and vary it. So that way you could say the same post five different ways by switching up the format, switching up the visuals, switching up the words, but keeping the visuals the same. Like there's so many different ways that you could do it without having to reinvent the wheel every time. So I would say those are three of my favorite parts of simple social media. That and the 80s and 90s references that you could get in a playlist that I've put on Spotify based on all the songs that are referenced in the book. Nice. Well, that's awesome. Like, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Like, that's such a great breakdown. I, I could tell already we could probably go on for like two hours and there's probably two or three more episodes in us to kind of go do a deeper dive. But thank you for giving this overview of your book and your insights. I love following you on social. I like the, your way of approaching things. It's like, it's so disarming, you know, in a world where everyone's <laughs> sort of alarmed by, you know, you got to do these things. There's this tension. And I think you, what I like about what you're you're saying is it, it's making people feel like relaxed and that there's a solution that's like, that doesn't overcomplicate things. And I love that. So thank you for being on the show. Um, where can they follow you? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn at Annie Schiffman. You can find me on Instagram at Annie Schiffman. And you can go to simplesocialmediabook.com and you'll be able to email me and get the free resources for Simple Social Media and order the book. Beautiful. Thank you again for being on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for listening. You bet. And then while you said listening, as usual, just go to groundswell.fm. Drop me a, a voicemail in the mic in, in groundswell.fm. What you like, what you don't like, give me your comments. I love hearing from you. Remember, um, we've got the Groundswell Inner Circle. Just go to groundswellinnercircle.com if you want to join our community. And last but not least, thank you and mahalo. Mm -hmm.